Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Bioshock Infinite. Well, last time Elizabeth suggested we go do a little grave robbing, so that's what we're off to do. Well, first a little sightseeing. My god, that's creepy. Do these people realize how creepy this is? Would it look that creepy if everything weren't covered in smoke and clouds? Now, that's a real question. Of course, it would be covered in clouds, like, half the time anyway. It's kind of up at the sky and all that. Sort of one of the hazards of the location. Not as much here as I was hoping, but then there is a safe in the corner here. Could you take a look at this lock? Okay. Done. There's the graveyard where my mother's buried. Huh. Well, here's a kinetoscope. Hmm. I don't know, this one seems familiar. I think we've seen it before. Yeah, this is familiar. Well, it's good to have repeats now and again for your collectibles. I mean, when there's a justification for it, like with these. Makes it more likely that you'll be able to actually complete the set. And that's nice. I was hoping there would be something up there, but no such luck. Where are you going? Come on. What are we looking for? There it is. Now! now! On it. I get the sneaking suspicion that even though everybody is dead, I may happen to need some of these tears in the near future. Call it a hunch. Hmm. Fortunate number of empty corpses around here again. Really, it has been quiet for the past while now. Why did that guy hang himself? Or, wait, did he hang himself? Well then, why did the Vox hang him in the corner like that? That also makes no sense. More money. Okay, catch! And the idea behind hanging someone is to make a spectacle, so... Damn it. Doesn't look like there's a way past that, so... crappy Vox weapons around here. Kind of hard to tell who won. Although, honestly, with everybody dead, it really doesn't matter, does it? Ah, crap. Guess I won't be able to hang on to that last tear. It's your mother's grave. They have her preserved in an airtight chamber. Her fingerprints will get us into Comstock House. She's your mother. A mother who abandons their child doesn't draw a lot of sympathy in my book. Take a moment to think about what you're doing. There. Will you open the door, or do I have to go in without you? It disappeared. Huh. Her. How are you, Mother? All locked up in there, huh? Looks like you and I have some common ground. Let me do it. No. Let me do it. Bad enough we're, we've gotten this far, you know? You see, child? You chose to follow a false 
false shepherd, and he has led you astray. What I do, I do for love. What lions does not cringe to see their coven pain, but spare the rod, spoil the child. If you won't listen to me, perhaps you will listen to your mother. Elizabeth, are you all right? Where, where did she go? Hold on, you need to rest for a minute. No, I'm getting that hand. Elizabeth, why is your mother a ghost? She's not. He, he used me to, to power that device. He opened up some kind of tear. And that's about the best explanation the game is going to give you for why we are now fighting the siren, as they call her. Seem your mother is raising the dead. All right, smacked her down to half health. That's going in the right direction, but if I want a good angle on her, I looks like I'm gonna have to come up here. Oh, there she is. Come on, you see-through bitch. Take it like a woman. Why did you come? Why did you come? What is she? I don't know. What am I? My god. Is she the source of my power? But what is she? Alive or dead? Why do you ask me? When the delicious question is when. The only difference between past and present is semantics. Lives, lived, will live. Dies, died, will die. If we could perceive time as it truly was. What reason would grammar professors have to get out of bed? Like us all, Lady Comstock exists across time. She is both alive and dead. She perceives being both. She finds this condition disagreeable. Perception without comprehension is a dangerous combination. Look! Footsteps. She goes to unfinished business. We have to follow her. Convince her to open the gate to Comstock House. Uh, okay, so... Um, let me try and put this together. In... String Theory, there are 11 dimensions, and I still can't get through that goddamn grate. There are 11 dimensions, one of them is time. All the others are space. The perception of different periods of time by using tears, that is looking it's into... It's a shame you have need of her to enter Comstock House. Frankly, she doesn't seem all that cooperative. There is a way to bring her to reason. Three truths you must discover first. Truths which, in this world, Comstock has destroyed. If only one of you had the power to alter time and space. That would be a blessing, wouldn't it? Hmm. Sarcastic. There's something off about Lady Comstock. Yeah, I noticed. No, you don't understand. She she doesn't belong here. I brought something through. I'm just I'm not so sure it was her. Okay, so as I was saying, the perception of a difference in time, in traveling forwards and backwards in time, that is not actually traveling through time, that is traveling to a dimension which is otherwise similar to our own, except that there is a difference in apparent time periods. In all cases, present exists and passes forward through time the same way as all other forms. The same as in all other dimensions, I mean. It's 
is one of those other theme songs, by the way. I can kind of see why, based on the lyrics. My dear brother, these holes in the thin air continue to pay dividends. I know not which musician you borrow your notes from, but if he has half the genius of the biologist I now observe, well, then you are to be the Mozart of Columbia. I think that's Fink's brother there on the floor, clutching a portrait of her, of his wife. Girlfriend, daughter, mother, didn't get a good look. I don't know how old the woman in the portrait is. But yeah, so um, the whole existing separate from time thing, that's not actually a part of string theory. You can't do that. You can only exist simultaneously within realities in which those realities are forwards and backwards of time as considered to the one you would call home. Do it. There you go. I know that sounds like I'm quibbling. Go on without me. But it kind of makes a difference. See when you're talking oh, what the hell? There he is! <laughs> Okay, so I apparently jump straight into a damn it. At least I shot a whole bunch of those guys, so shouldn't be too bad moving forward. Yeah, as I was saying, there, there is an important distinction when you're talking about something unstuck from time, because... I see a lockpick over there. It is not unstuck from time. It is still proceeding forward in time the same as anyone else. It's just experiencing multiple realities simultaneously. And as such, I really don't understand what the siren is supposed to be. I mean, aside from being, you know, a ghost story. And hey, that's everything. My primary two weapons are now fully upgraded. Let's go to town on whoever's left up here. You. I heard you. Brothers. And you. And I'm done. Nice. I guess this is one of our destinations. Right up your alley. I can do that. As such, I think I might want to look around before I go in there. I mean, I am looking for three destinations in total, but I... I've got this compulsion, you know, to avoid making progress whenever possible. I think it's from all the JRPGs I've played over time. You know you're going the wrong way when you're making progress through the plot. All the goodies are hidden down dead ends. I believe at this point I was also looking for something in particular, and I was not having very much luck finding it. Because as I realized later, the thing I was looking for was in fact inside that building, which I am currently avoiding. Locked. Elizabeth? Really? That little old lock. But on the plus side, I did find this. All yours. Cotton candy. Exactly what you would expect to find inside a chocolate box. Hmm. No. I mean, it is fairly nice. 
but I picked my weapon specifically so I wouldn't have to worry about ammunition every five minutes. Like, that's why you have to avoid weapons like the RPG and the Hello. Ah, oh, crap. That was whiskey. But no, I was saying, you have to, uh... Found some money. Want it? You have to avoid the RPG and the sniper rifle because they don't give you enough ammunition to really get through an area. You know, if you were allowed to carry more than two weapons, that would be fine, but you're not. It would be like a good fourth weapon, but you don't get four weapons. You only get two. But then again, if you are relying on a sniper rifle and the RPG, then, yeah, Scavenger comes highly recommended. Comstock has sabotaged our contraption. Yet, we are not dead. A theory. We are scattered amongst the possibility space. But my brother and I are together, and so I am content. He is not. The business with the girl lies unresolved. But perhaps there is one who can finish it in our stead. Yeah, again, possibility space does not really describe how string theory works. But already. I, I don't know, that, that'd be kind of like calling outer space directional space. Because, yeah, you can go in directions when you're in outer space, but that doesn't really explain what's going on. Hmm. Well, that's Booker's office address. Only question is, which one obstacle were they thinking of with that lighthouse? The obstacle of getting him there? There's something in there. Should I open it? A lighthouse keeper, maybe? I've heard that as an option. Comstock seems to have been made sterile by simple exposure to our contraption. A theory. Just as sexual reproduction can de emphasize the traits of each parent, so goes the effect of multiple realities on our own. Your traits dissipate until they become unrecognizable, or cease to exist. Yeah, that or it's pumping out immense amounts of radiation, because that'll make you sterile too. Although to be fair, no one really knew about the dangers of radiation until the 1920s and 30s. You are! That's my mother! I assure you, madam, my sexual interest in your dear prophet is non-existent. Madame Lutess! Furthermore, the man is quite sterile. Yes, Come here, you little bastard! I want her out of my house! Sterile. They weren't my parents. But then what were you to them? A child that decided to impress her. She deserved whatever Comstock did to her. Lady Comstock. What did you mean before when you said Lady Comstock didn't belong here? She's almost feral. It's like she's a reflection of... Um... I don't know. Alright, let's try this again. Lady Comstock seems to believe the child is a result of some errant act of carnality between myself and her beloved prophet. I told the poor woman the truth, that the child was a product of our little contraption, but I think she found that less believable than her delusion. She took a baby out of the loom. I really hope someone got that. I wonder what her story is. Like, in how many realities that we've conjoined did she die? Found some money. Every little bit helps. In, in 
fact, we are just about at a full circuit by this point. We're getting closer now. Grand Central Depot is not that far away. But yeah, they try to explain the siren a bit more in what's going to be the next video, but it's uh, pretty much as vague as it is now. Essentially, it reflects more on Elizabeth's mental state than... Yep, we've been here before. But she re reflects more on Elizabeth's mental state than she does on anything like a physical reality that we would be familiar with. But the problem with that is that, you know, even with infinite universes you would still need one that understands cause and effect, and that's a lot of crows. No mercy for us! Yeah. For you! Saw that coming. Oh, by the way, in case you were wondering, some of the uh, Order of the Raven dudes are working with the Vox Populi, and the reason... The reason they are working with the Vox Populi... is because of... Oh, I am liking this stun ability. Taste this. That's what I thought. Oh yeah, you want some of this too, huh? Eat it! Ha! <laughs> Can't even make a run at me, son of a bitch. Holy hell, I, I killed that one guy so hard, I killed the guy behind him. That or a corpse behind him. Either way, real fun. Catch. I am really enjoying this combination of stuff. <laughs> oh. What the hell was I even talking about? Oh yeah, so yeah, some order of the Raven guys have joined the Vox Populi, and the reason is because they have discovered that Comstock is technically related to Native Americans. And so since he isn't, you know, pure of the blood, they feel they have to depose him. Go figure. But yeah, as for the Siren, yeah, in order to interact with this universe, it has to agree the laws of cause and effect. That means that everything... What could this place have to do with my mother? Everything that happened in the past must have a causal reason which cohabits the universe she comes from. Which means there must also be an Elizabeth who... I don't know, came from that, or interacted with that version of her mother. And I just, I, I don't see that happening. I'm pretty sure I've seen these three before, but I am just being careful, because I have turned off pop-ups and I have no way of knowing. Yeah, that's, that's just my issue that, like, you cannot actually include every possible, you know, story in an infinite universe. Not in one, not in a scientific infinite universe. Because you get those stories where people stop acting like people, but just for specific instances and in ways that are in line with the author's intentions or agenda rather than in line with the character's own internal desires or motivations. So that's why you can't necessarily... I mean, the, the fact that they are otherwise similar to Earth means that they would otherwise have to exist 
as normal humans up to that point. At which point they stop acting like humans because the author doesn't know how to write humans. That's the issue with the idea of saying that every version of reality, every mental illustration we can come up with exists in the multiverse. It, uh, it doesn't. Because we can conceive of conjunctions of realism and unrealism that cannot exist in a stable universe. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, my mother, the Siren. It's uh, kind of out of left field, even in an infinite multiverse, but I think I've talked enough about that in the video. So, instead, I will now visit History Corner and talk about how ghosts are actually pretty apropos for the time period. Because the turn of the last century was a real heyday for spiritualism and psychics. Let's tackle the first one first, and then the other, shall we? The Origin of Seances Contacting the dead is obviously a concept a lot older than a hundred years. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, as his friend Enkidu lies dying, Enkidu has a vision of the underworld and sees its residents all sitting around eating dirt. Turns out being dead kind of sucks. Odysseus went to the entrance to the underworld and communed with the dead, basically as a side trip during his story, and he also sees Achilles, who reiterates that being dead sucks, and in fact, uh, dying young was about the worst idea he'd ever had. Then of course, there's Heracles, Theseus, Aeneas, Orpheus, Ishtar, Jesus, of course, and Dante. And I'm just listing the people who actually went to the afterlife and came back. I don't think I could name all the people who only just spoke with a dead person in myths and legends. But here's the big difference between seances and spiritualism as compared to all those other instances that came before it. Spiritualism is agnostic. Usually when you talk about spirits and ghosts, it has to involve some vision of the afterlife, and usually afterlifes are tied in with some sort of religious belief system. But spiritualism? No. It's got no gods, it's got no end goal like with Buddhism. It's just the magic without all the baggage. Of course, this means you can attach spiritualism to any existent belief system, but you don't have to. The rise of spiritualism would in part lead to the rise of such things as neo-paganism and Wicca, which are religions, but it isn't. I think that's why overall it got more scientific scrutiny than its religious brethren. But I'm wandering off topic. Spiritualism was essentially born with the Fox Sisters, Margaret and Kate in 1848. One of the sisters tied an apple to a string and used it to create eerie knocking sounds in their home. Kate confronted the mysterious knocker and, over time, the sisters developed a code language which they used to explain that the knocking was coming from the ghost of a person who was murdered in the house. Eventually, the girl's parents decided that this was altogether too much excitement for two young ladies, and so they were sent to live with their relatives in Rochester, New York. And go figure, but the knocking sounds followed them. The local Quaker community ate it up. And because Quakers happen to be one of the nicest religious organizations you'll ever encounter, so began the relationship between spiritualism, feminism, and the temperance movement. The two girls became spiritual mediums, and within five years, spiritualism and the seance would take off across America. Of course, not everyone was ready to accept rapping sounds, moving tables, and flickering lights as proof of supernatural occurrences. Skeptics 
noted that the knocking sounds stopped when the girls were forced to place their feet on pillows, and they correctly guessed that they were popping their toe joints to create the sounds they used for their seances. Later mediums would go on to put together bigger and bolder shows. By the light of a single small candle, a lot of things will appear real that aren't, and you're a lot more willing to accept spooky explanations while you're feeling spooked. Spectral apparitions are light shows and dolls hidden away in closets and behind curtains. Taps and raps the medium caused with their feet, or with devices hidden in the massive skirts women had to wear at the time. Disappearing and reappearing objects are caused by misdirection and palming techniques. Ectoplasm is either some sort of smooth cloth or paper which the medium conceals on her person, or else it's the sort of goo you find in canned meat. The joining of the hands, which supposedly combines the energy of the participants, is actually performed so that you won't think the medium is manipulating things, but she either manipulates things with her feet, she has an assistant in a back room who's operating the show, or else one of the participants is a plant who lets her have a free hand while everything is dark. Seance production values were probably at their peak around a hundred years ago, and at that point, a certain related profession got involved. See, uh, a Mr. Houdini's mother died in the early 1920s, and in his grief, he contacted a number of spiritual mediums in the hopes of talking with her again. Unfortunately, for every medium he visited, he noticed the same tricks which he used in his own trade. But where the modern illusionist and magician may not explain how they perform their tricks, they are all perfectly willing to admit that what they do isn't magic. As such, Houdini was offended by the fact that these mediums were using the same techniques as magicians in order to pass off fake predictions and convenient lies as actual contact with dead relatives. Throughout the rest of his life, cut short though it was, Houdini went around discrediting and debunking every medium he could. He wrote a book about how mediums perform their tricks, and he was collaborating on another one with H.P. Lovecraft of all people when he died. He lost the friendship of Arthur Conan Doyle because, despite being the man who wrote the sentence, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth, Doyle completely believed in mediums, spirits, fairies, supernatural entities of all kinds. Houdini also joined the Scientific American Committee, which offered a cash reward to any medium able to prove the reality of spirits. And to this day, that reward has never been claimed. Modern Day Psychics the psychic powers also have a tradition that goes back to the origin of history and beyond. And once again, the difference is that it's the agnostic variation on an otherwise religious phenomenon. Divine inspiration. God, or multiple gods, have been telling us things for generations, including prophecies of future events, hints about what other people are thinking, and insight into past events we never saw ourselves. Or else they invest us with divine power and allow us to command miracles which are otherwise impossible for any man or woman to accomplish. So what's responsible if we take away the divinity but keep the special effects? Why, it must be some supernatural inborn talent, of course. It couldn't possibly be luck, coincidence, or trickery that's doing it. For example, the most important feature of any seance, psychic reading, or any other such session is the cold read. Essentially, cold reading is a series of techniques which a person can use to infer information based on a person's appearance, body language, and any other information they may happen to volunteer during the reading. You start out with general statements, which might apply to anyone or might apply to any person of the subject's age, gender, and apparent social standing. 
And if the subject is eager and gullible, he or she will very often happily agree and fill in a few more details which the reader can use to make more assumptions and go on from there. And the best part of an eager and gullible audience is that they will willingly and unconsciously edit out the details you get wrong. Human brains are so desperate to find patterns that they often have trouble acknowledging or even remembering the aberrations to this pattern, even if the aberrations mean that there is no pattern in the first place. Here's a good one for you. The magic number is seven. Seven is magic because once you start looking for it, it'll show up everywhere. Oh, but six is magical too, and so is eight. You can do this with basically every number between one to 100, but it'll show up especially easy with numbers 1 through 10. Oh, and did you know that I'm psychic too? I know all about you. And I don't mean that generally. I mean you, specifically. For instance, I'm betting you know how to really let loose at a party. But sometimes you're more comfortable sitting in the back, letting someone else have the spotlight. You're also very kind and caring. But when someone betrays your trust, you find it very hard to forgive them. You love what modern technology can do for you, but sometimes you feel like you were born in the wrong era. What I just did is called a rainbow ruse, because what I just described was an entire spectrum. I started with a personal trait cast in a positive light, and then I said that you're the opposite thing too. Since most humans are not in fact the physical embodiments of one trait, I've effectively described everyone with every one of those statements. If you wanted to believe me, and if you didn't know what I was doing, then you would have agreed with my statements about you, and you probably would have been a bit more inclined to think that I was really psychic. Personal Thoughts I've spoken before about the differences, or the lack thereof, between science and magic and every other belief system. And while a rationalist would be loath to admit it, there is a fair amount of belief that goes into a scientific view of the world. Unless you can perform every experiment in every field personally, and perform all those experiments often enough to be confident in their results, you are trusting that others have performed those experiments correctly, have come to the most accurate conclusions, and have successfully communicated these results to you. But the difference with science is this. Science is not actually concerned with explaining the past. Anyone can explain the past in a way that fits with their theories and beliefs. There are enough vague spots in history and the fossil record, enough unexplained phenomenon and observations and alternate explanations that you could cobble together a description of history to fit just about any given philosophy. But science is not concerned with explaining the past. Science wants to predict the future. Consider this. The foremost feature of science is the experiment. And the linchpin of every experiment is the hypothesis, an attempt to predict the result of the experiment. If the result doesn't match up, it doesn't mean the experiment was a failure, although there are plenty of ways for an experiment to fail. What it means is that the hypothesis was a failure. And as such, the experiment must be performed again with a new hypothesis, performed again and again until the result can be predicted with a statistical certainty. At that point, the hypothesis becomes a working theory. Then, if it proves impossible to get an aberrant result without there being a flaw in the experiment, the theory upgrades to a scientific law. But here's the thing, even laws can be broken. A true rationalist must be willing to admit that everything he or she knows to be true and irrefutable may not be as certain as all that. Even the laws of science may be incorrect or incomplete and in need of an update. If a law cannot correctly predict the result of an experiment or a discovery or an observation, it must be discarded 
and replaced. In science, nothing is sacred. The scientific view of human history has come to be because it, so far, successfully predicts where we will find artifacts and what newly discovered historical documents will say. The scientific view of Earth's history is based on which strata produce which fossils, and our age estimates are based on how quickly we know certain radioactive elements decay. If we were to find solid, unadulterated evidence that contradicts these views, we will change them. When we found out that matter is an expression of energy, the conservation of mass became the conservation of mass and energy. When we discovered that Pluto is not alone in its orbital field, we changed its classification to dwarf planet for the same reason that Ceres was downgraded from planet to asteroid when we realized that it was in a belt of asteroids which weren't much smaller than it. Scientists are also open-minded about things that are classified as supernatural and paranormal phenomena. The US government operated something called the Stargate Project for around 15 years which was dedicated to researching psychic powers. But the CIA shut it down in 1995 because it never produced concrete results. Before he died, Houdini swore to his friends that he would try and contact him after he died, and for 10 years they held a seance on the anniversary of his death to try and reach him. But he never came. Last year, Bill Nye debated Ken Ham at the Creation Museum in Kentucky, and when he was asked what it would take to change his mind, Nye said, one piece of evidence that proves I'm wrong. That's it. Ken Ham said that nothing would change his mind. And that's the difference right there. Now there are religious belief systems that will admit that the humans are fallible and that we don't know everything yet, but with science, that is the central tenet, that what we know is that we know nothing. Thanks for joining me again in History Corner, and I hope I'll see you soon.